Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. In 1957, Sputnik 1 was the first artificial satellite launched into low Earth orbit, and as a species, we've been launching these social, economic, and scientifically important objects ever since. In this episode, my guests and I plan to cover the science behind satellite launches, their orbits, time correction, and the data that they collect. But before we get into the details of satellites, we get a little personal and talk about my guest's time as an Earth observation data engineer and discuss her involvement with both InnoFlare and UMETSAT. Speaking of my guest, please meet Noemi Marsico. Noemi is an Earth observation data engineer working for InnoFlare as a contractor for UMETSAT. She holds a bachelor's in environmental science and a master's in hydrology with a focus on remote sensing. Her current job involves the management of data access services and the support of UMETSAT users through training. In her free time, Noemi is a passionate science communicator and has been involved in numerous works with universities and organizations such as Greenpeace. If you have Instagram, I highly recommend that you give her a follow at nowoman.noscience. So, now that you've been introduced to my guest star and the topic of this podcast, we are going to head into the first segment where we plan to talk about Noemi's involvement in remote sensing with InnoFlare and UMETSAT. Cheers. Noemi, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Hello, Sam. Hi, I'm doing good. How are you? How are you doing? Very well. I'm, <laughs> my apartment's extremely bare now because I'm getting ready to move again, which is exciting. It's just... Of, of course, not... a little stressful. But... Yeah, that's that's really cool. Don't worry. I I have actually put my 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 computer on the other side of the room because usually I'm over there, but because that side is prettier, so you see a bit of like satellites. I have a little model here. I don't know if you know this. It's a really, uh... really cute model. Um, yeah. So uh, that's why I have the good background. But if I was turned on the other right, on the other way, it wouldn't be that cool. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. That's that's really fitting. Love the backdrop. It's very nice. Way better than my white walls. Just only <laughs> white walls. But um, this first segment, we're going to talk about your journey in terms of um, what you do with satellites and also InnoFlare and UMETSAT, correct? Yes. Yes, of course. So Sweet. I... I am an Earth Observation Data Engineer. I have recently started my new position, um, and I am an employee of InnoFlare, uh, which is a software company, and we are contractors for UMETSAT. This means that UMETSAT is getting us as a team uh, from InnoFlare, and we are doing some work for UMETSAT. Um, I don't know if you know what UMETSAT is. It, it is really weird because like, it's really common for people not to know what UMETSAT is, even though it's one of the biggest and most important organizations, space organization of Europe. So UMETSAT actually stands for the European Organization for Meteorological Exploitation of Satellites. So U <laughs> for Europe, uh, MET for Meteorological, and SAT for Satellites. Okay. <laughs> um, and that's what, what, what it stands for. So. Uh, I'm actually working as employee of InnoFlare, but working for a project with UMETSAT. So what we do is um, using data. So the the data that we that we have that we collect from the satellites from UMETSAT satellites, we put them in platforms, and then we teach the users how to download the data, to take them, and how they can uh, work with them. So it's a really interesting topic because you end up working with a, a lot of different sectors of science because in the end, satellites data can be used literally for anything and that's and that's a really a really cool part of the of the job that I do but again I just started a few months ago two months ago in January uh, so I'm really fresh as well oh that's exciting yeah I, I don't think most people know what UMITSAT is actually uh, I honestly <laughs> am not that familiar uh, I'm more familiar with literally only the ESA <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I feel you. Uh, but also like the classic NASA, you know, like everybody knows NASA, um, but like <laughs> maybe like ESA is not as considered UMETSAT or I don't know, the Swedish space organization, you know, things like that. But it, there is a really good work and a lot of employees and a lot of people doing incredible 
jobs and it's a really a great environment to grow your experience it's a, it's a great place yeah absolutely so how did you get involved with all of this curious yeah so basically why i started um as a normal bachelor 19 years old bachelor student uh, i moved from italy to london um and i actually had a lot of fun those those years i actually didn't even know english when i moved there so it was quite challenging for me at the beginning so i started environmental sciences there and then i finished it and i started a master in hydrology um, and throughout throughout the master, I started as well, kind of focusing on remote sensing um, and satellites. That's that was because the year before I did an internship in the Italian Space Agency, and I started to you know understanding a bit how satellites work and how you can use satellites and new technologies uh, on a more environmental perspective, which is uh, I think it's a great way we have to study the planet. Um, so then my my hydrology master thesis was based on analyzing suspended sediments in the Baltic Sea. So I was using remote sensing data um, from Olchi that is a sensor from Sentinel-3. Um, I was using this data to calculate how the concentration of um, sediments brought from a river to the sea. And it was really interesting because I did the coolest part, that is the validation, I think is the coolest part, because validation means when you validate that your data, your satellite data are actually reflective uh, for your samples. So what you do is actually going on the sea, collecting samples and then compare your values from the sample with what you got from the the satellite, uh, and it's a really really interesting. I went for two days on a on a, um, a research cruise, and it was uh, amazing. And I got to yeah, <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Uh, I also made an Instagram reel. I made my supervisors back then dance on the on the boat, and it was <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, and so yeah, that's how I I, I started to uh, learn and know a bit more about remote sensing and and that's how i ended up then in numetsat after oh. a year a year from my graduation oh wow that's really cool so you were on the aspect of taking the data and comparing yes. it to what you get into the field but you're not doing that same role now it's more just based on just the satellite data itself yes yes exactly so back then it was more of a more scientific actual mm -hmm. sense of how to use remote sensing data right now is a bit more engineering that's why my title is my title is data engineer because um we don't do that part of analyzing the data we take the data uh, we put them in certain platforms and we make sure that that users have for example jupyter notebooks that they can use to analyze their data um and we we create trainings uh so i am currently creating the training for the data access services so all the data accesses that human Sat has for people to get and get into the data download their data um so i'd give the training for these people to learn about how to download our data and utilize them but the part of the actual using the data that's more of a scientific part and it's also used mm -hmm. by humans humans itself does have their training part uh, and i'm also part of that but i am not i am not the the main one who creates the training in this more scientific sense you know how how you can use marine training but i but i did enter i do enter in um, in trainings that are already organized for example by marine experts or atmosphere experts and i collaborate with them it's a cool. really interesting it's a it's a huge there's a lot of work because it's a lot of data and and uh, you know you have to manage them and, and that's a really interesting part how many satellites are under UMETSAT? Um, there are five missions, I think. Okay. Um, I hope not people from UMETSAT will not kill me after this podcast if I made say something wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think there are five five missions and more satellites within each mission. And actually, the the, the thing that I showed you before that I already mm -hmm. showed you now, this one. Um, this is a Meteos, Meteosat. It's uh, one of their missions, and it's a third generation. Uh, it's uh, a new satellite, and I actually went to their lounge. The lounge itself was in New Guinea, so I didn't go to the lounge lounge, but I did go <laughs> to the lounge party in Netherlands. Um, so oh. we were attending the lounge, and there were 
all the most important people of ESA um, and UMETSAT, because of course this is a collaboration with UMETSAT and ESA. Um, and it was it was really, really interesting, I have to say. It was one of the best experiences I've ever had. Um, so it's, it's quite a lot of satellites, uh, not too many if you consider overall how many satellites there are around the planet. Um, but yeah. They are really good satellites and they provide a lot of great data. Oh yeah. So my last question, because I'm I'm just yeah. curious, the data that that you collect from these satellites and you put onto these platforms, uh, what type of access is it? Is it like private access or is this like like publicly like accessible? Or is it like in between like you have contractors and stuff that you want to keep things private? Yeah, so generally speaking, on a more broad sense um they're public um the, the majority of them so if okay. you if you sam want to type on on internet you met view for example that's a, an interface where you can get the data and it's a really simple interface you can just um look at the data put layers on your map and download the data and same for other platforms like the data store for example um and it was it's a it's a really interesting way of downloading data but not every data is for everybody uh but yeah. the majority uh, of the data are probably free so is is okay okay i'm, I'm also curious i'm sorry i'm, I'm doing no. this this is fun no. So whenever you capture the data, whenever you get the data from the from the satellite, do you do anything with it? Like cancel white noise, like that you are accustomed to maybe interpreting in most of your, your data sets, or is it all just raw, like completely raw? Um, so you you can have access to different data. There are there are people uh at UMETSAT and there are other type of scientists that do work with um, with native formats, so the real raw format. Uh, but usually you kind of process them. So maybe you have okay. a level one or level two or level three data, so they are space and time binned. So you do need to process them quite a bit before you're actually able to use it. For example, for me that I was a master's student, I was not going to be able to process probably something um, that was native. I got a level two data, um, but it really depends. There are a lot of types and you can get either the raw data or the already processed data. Um, there are scientists that actually do that as their job, so. Hmm. Okay, pretty cool. So I, I want to, I feel like this is a good transition point because we had a couple other things that we wanted to talk about before we ended this segment. So how did we start getting satellites and looking at the earth, studying the earth? How in, I guess a little bit of why too, maybe sprinkled yeah. in there. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay, so imagine that the very first time somebody talked about remote sensing, uh, it was a professor, she was a woman, uh, Anyway, <laughs> yes, um, her name was uh, Ele Eleanor, I think, Prout, Elise Prout, something like that. Sorry, I don't remember exactly the name, uh, but certainly the surname was Prout. Um, and she actually was a geographer and she started understanding that you can, you can actually use cameras, for example, to retrieve information about something without being in direct contact with it. So this was the main part. So how can we take information about some, something without being in contact? And how great is that when something is so big like the earth uh, that we cannot just go and go around and take samples about each centimeter of the Pacific Ocean that we have, you know? Um, so that's how it started the word and then later a few years later in the 57th actually it was 1957 that the soviet union sent the first earth observation satellite and it was called sputnik one um and it was it was really it was, if you see the pictures they're really nice it, it was just literally just like a ball uh with four <laughs> with four little antennas and it just sent radio waves and it was funny because um, it literally did like, I think, two turns around the earth and then it stopped working. <laughs> but, but it was a great, a great first step. Um, so then NASA started with, with, the, with their satellites and Soviet Union kept on. And then slowly, slowly got a much bigger 
a much bigger impact. And, and I think it's great for environmental research because again, usually when you go on site, it's really time consuming and it's really pricey. Uh, mm -hmm. Just imagine that you're taking five, five ex example of my thesis, you take five samples, maybe 10 in total, of 10 places of 10 stations and and you took three days you spent a lot of fuel for the boat and you spent a lot of manpower for all the scientists on the boat um so remote sensing actually allows you to get more data in in a really short amount of time and even though sometimes it's not a real perfect data but there is a lot that has been done and it's increasing and it's improving and there is so much that we are learning for example this one is as well this new um meteor meteosat it's going to be able for the first time for europe to take information about lightnings so before Ooh. Europe, we didn't have any satellite that would take information about lightning. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be able to, to detect exactly where the lightning is going to strike because that's not yeah. going to happen. Not yet, but it's giving a lot of information and it can help a lot in many different businesses and many different industries can use remote sensing and it's it's really great. Yeah, absolutely. So I have like two things that I wanted to add to that. First, the, the lady's name is Evelyn Pruitt. Evelyn. Yeah. yeah. I was like, Eleanor, Elise. You were, <laughs> I, I missed the E. <laughs> I you remember. Were close. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the second thing is uh, the Sputnik thing. So that launch, it, it's so funny because like satellites were kind of invented more or less for the political, the geopolitical reasons um, that we don't really want to like, you know, be yeah, happy yes. about, you know, or more ashamed about it. Cause like the Russian Sputnik one was created to be able to spy on uh, like the United States activities and NASA had to counter with their own <laughs> you know, kind of like spy yeah. equipment. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, a little lackluster. Yeah. <laughs> I knew it was the first Earth observer. Like I, I rather was the first Earth observation satellite, but clearly they wanted to observe something else beside the Earth. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, typically satellites have you know multi purposes. So yeah, of course, of course, yes. Yeah, so just, just to note the the satellites I'm talking about. It's always Earth observation. There is no there is communication, military, commercial. I'm usually talking about mm -hmm. Earth observation pure satellites so oh, that's, that's a great thing that i think we should yeah. add to this is that satellites is uh more involved than you think and really a satellite is anything that revolves around like a body in space so what we're talking about is artificial satellites yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah yes yeah. exactly it's uh, it's really common because you know it's a uh, when you say, I actually heard people saying, I don't know, but the moon is not a satellite because they are so used to hearing mm -hmm. satellite as the artificial satellite. And it's like, no, the moon is actually a satellite. <laughs> uh, we just stole the war and put it on our artificial one. <laughs> um, uh, yes, it's it's a really good point. Well done for, for <laughs> raising it. Yeah, uh, precisely. So the last thing that I think we should cover before we roll into our first commercial break is we've talked about these different agencies, of course. We've mentioned uh, UMINSAT, we've mentioned the ESA, we've mentioned NASA. Why do you think um, most people credit or you know point their eyes towards NASA, their eyes and their ears, whatever their sensories, towards NASA over other agencies? Yes, well, that, that's a, that's a, um, I ask myself that question um, in the sense that NASA is obviously the the richest space organization, and it's also one of the oldest. So probably we also have a little bit of the American influence. So people have this really good, um, really strong. Sorry, I didn't say good. <laughs> really strong American influence. So um, I think that's one of the most important reasons why NASA it's uh, it's such a big part and i think they also have really great communicators not saying that that isa doesn't because they have great communicators too but there is kind of like this sort of admiration admiration for nasa mm. um which is not the same for many other agencies and i think that's really sad because um many many of the missions are conducted in uh, in a collaboration 
and there is so much that uh, all the other agencies, space agencies are doing, even the, like the Indian space agency is doing great, um, Italian space agency is actually doing amazing, and there is an incredible amount of agencies that are doing great job, and it's sad seeing people acknowledging only NASA as the biggest space agency. Sometimes I say, okay, well, I'm going, for example, I'm going to the lounge organized by ESA, and people are like, what is ESA? And it's, <laughs> wow, what is ESA? <laughs> but if I would have said NASA, then everybody would have been like, oh, wow, that's crazy. Um, so yeah. I think I think this is something that certainly population society has to you know acknowledge a little bit more other agencies and other works that are done within the same business. Yeah, it's extremely important to realize that space work is mostly collaborative. I mean, there are a few exceptions, of course, yeah, uh, of but course. that's of course back to the geopolitical issues, not really the the science issues. But yeah, yeah, I, I would say like whenever I'm doing my science communication, especially with like, you know, talking about space and stuff like that, a lot of my information does come from the ESA. The ESA has a lot of amazing articles because, of course, they're just as credible as, as NASA. The funny thing that I grabbed from that is that you said that, that NASA has the largest like um, like budget or worth. And yeah. that's that's hilarious because it's not hilarious that it's wrong. It's just hilarious that like, it's still not even that much. Like what NASA does with their budget is is yeah. kind of insane. Um, yeah. If you think about like the US budget overall versus the percentage that NASA gets, it's 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 extremely small. Okay. Um, I've, well, I've said my gripes on that yeah. many times in the past, but yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's funny that you say that. And that's crazy because now that you think of like these other agencies, that have a lot of like great accomplishments are doing it off of even smaller budgets, which is yeah. pretty cool to know. No, exactly. It's uh, it's incredible. I didn't know that at all. Um, and it's uh, I, I didn't really read much about the economy of America, like just the basics. Uh, but I didn't see the percentage of, of fundings put in, in space agency. Um, but it's it is crazy what they do and and uh, all the things that are organized and all the things that are planned. Uh, but again, it's everything is a collaboration, yeah. especially science generally. That's what I always talk about. I feel that science is such a collaborative thing that we kind of go slower if we keep our information to ourselves. Um, if we would start actually collaborating between everybody, we would reach to a much better understanding of everything of every part of science so um collaborations are always the best thing that you can do oh absolutely i totally agree and before before we jump into break i just want to say this pretty quickly that i, I had to google it uh in the 2020 budget for nasa was 22.6 billion dollars this year is 25.4 billion dollars now before you scream before you scream <laughs> the u.s spends I think between 700 and 800 billion dollars on their military budget. Oh. <laughs> so that's why I was saying that the percentage difference you're yeah. yeah. Wow. I, I leave you with that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, it's crazy. When we come back from break, we're going to talk about the science of satellites. So, stick around. We're back. This is segment two, and we're talking about maybe the non-juicy portion of the episode. In my opinion, it's it's pretty juicy, just because I'm talking about like physics and engineering, and Noemi's going to weigh in as well as we move through this. But I've prepared some notes, and I kind of narrowed it down to a few topics that I think are really, really interesting. How we get satellites into space, how we maintain that and then how we kind of correct it over time. Not we, I'm not involved. Other people, really smart people that are way, all the credit goes to them, all of it. So yeah, like obviously yeah. when you think about launching a satellite into space, you think about rocketry, right? Cause that's how we've been really doing it. There is another way that I think is, is really cool and I can mention that later, but um, it's kind of governed by propulsion or the rocket equation if you're not familiar and I'll, I'll make this swift so you know it doesn't bore the heck out of you <laughs> <laughs> sorry 
You go. No, no, okay. go, go, go for it. You no, know, I was saying that it's a that it's a great it's a great part of of satellites that I don't usually touch, and it's really interesting thinking about you know all the people that are actually working even before the actual taking the data and sending the satellite uh, over to space. So it's it's really interesting. Yeah, it's back to what you were saying before we went into break. It's you know it's all about that that collaboration, and um, it comes from all angles with this stuff. So whenever we think about rockets, we have to think about the payload and the fuel, and specifically the gravitational field influence. So that boils down to weight, right? Because um, we know what weight is. I hope, uh, but we have to think about differential weight because propulsion efficiency is driven by the gradient of the fuel that you're using over the trip because the fuel obviously dwindles you're using it and the gravitational field variation so as you leave earth's atmosphere or as you're um, moving away in earth's atmosphere you lose that gravitational pull which lessens the weight of the payload and the fuel and you lose the fuel so more weight is lost there as well so rocket engineers and really, really intelligent people have to use calculus because of these, these differentials. And the rocket equation, if you were to Google it, is involving like two extreme parameters, which is rocket velocity and exhaust velocity. And it's the balance of the two. So like how much rocket velocity am I going to need to balance the weight? And then how much will chemistry be able to provide me in exhaust velocity? So the exhaust velocity can be thought of as thrust or propulsion. And the biggest misconception that, that really irritates me, and I'll, I'll say this in a second, is that the force of the propulsion doesn't come from the exhaust pushing off of the ground or off of the atmosphere, because it just wouldn't make sense, because once you get into space, you're not pushing off of really anything. But where the force comes from is the exhaust pushing against the rocket itself. And you know, people who say that we've never been to space make that, that claim, but they don't understand Newton's third law, which is you know every force has an equal and opposite reaction force. And that's how we get propulsion. <laughs> Yeah. That, that was a really good explanation in a really short amount of time, Sam. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Um, additionally, I, I, I like this fun fact, is that rockets that we have designed, like the Saturn V rocket or uh, SpaceX's Starship, they only have an initial payload percentage. And the payload means, like, say, the people, the science equipment, the... Um, the things that are necessary for the mission, the objective, that initial payload is only two to maybe four and a half percent of the entire weight of the rocket. Yeah, let that sink in. That's that's insane. So if you do like a really weird thought experiment, and I've, I've thought about this before, is like if the conditions of Earth were different, if we had more mass, a stronger gravitational field, uh, so gravitational uh, influence as we're trying to escape, not escape, but um, move through uh, space time, we would have to figure something else out because right now we only have so many applicable ways to create that exhaust velocity. We'd kind of be in a bit of a pickle, I think. That is a, that is a crazy fun fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's And it's, how do you I, know so many things about rockets? Um. It's a hobby. I, I chose structural engineering, but I, I love I love aerospace. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So um, are you familiar with the types of satellite orbits? So like we, we've talked about how we get it up off of the Earth's surface, but like, do you know about any of the satellite orbits? Yeah, I I know about the orbits. Um, I wouldn't be able to tell you how much fuel I need is on a rocket to reach a certain orbit, but I do know, I know. <laughs> which orbits we have. If I'm not mistaken, we have mainly three orbits. So it's the Leo, Mio, and Geo. 
Um, so the most interesting for me that it's crazy just thinking about it, uh, the geo that is 36,000 kilometers from the equator actually. So it's it's an incredible, it's an incredible distance. And if you think that we are able to retrieve information from that distance with a satellite, it's unbelievable, honestly, it's just uh, incredible. And thinking about all the other, and the majority of satellites actually, they are in uh, Leo, I think. So it's uh, the closest, um, how, how much does it reach, five? five? Uh, no. It's between um, like zero, it, they, they say zero and like 500-ish miles. Okay, yeah. more or less, yeah. And and it, that's really that's where all the ISS is as well. Uh, it's yeah. in the orbit, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so, it's like 250 miles or something like that. It's 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 crazy, and and that that satellite is also the the biggest satellite we actually have. Uh, it's 108 meters long, and it, it's it's really it's really cool. I I was lucky enough to visit. Um, when I went for the launch, the, the reconstruction, I think it's called in English, reconstruction of the ISS. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get to enter and see everything. Um, and you imagine oh. it bigger than what it actually is. Like once you're inside the room where they sleep, it's it's a really little box, you know, and and <laughs> and it's crazy. It's just like going around and I'm a small woman and I entered there and I was like, oh my God, I'm getting claustrophobic. Um, <laughs> And and it's uh, it's really incredible. And then we also got to see, um, you know, the the classic cupola that you you get to you know look at the oh, earth. Yeah. Um, yes, and it, it was it was really interesting. But yes, so um, you it's it's actually important the orbits also when you download data. For example, in Umetsat we they do have this. They we I don't know how to say because I'm a contractor. They do have the 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 ticket the label Geo and Leo uh, depending on the, the type of data that you want to process. Um, mm. And it's really interesting how how different they can be between each other. Yeah, definitely. Um, I have some really cool uh, information. I think that yeah. would go into the into into more depth about Leo, Mio, and Geo, because you can actually split Geo into two different subcategories that I think are pretty cool to like talk about. But the Leo, like you said, is like zero to a few hundred miles up. Who the first person to like like really document and think about this is Sir Isaac Newton. I don't know if you knew uh, that. No, um, I didn't. He like postulated, I think it was in the late 1600s, he was thinking about, okay, if I have a projectile that I launch from the top of a mountain, I feel like if I shot it fast enough, it could hit me in the back of the head. Mm -hmm. And essentially what that means is like, if I shoot a projectile, it's falling towards earth. And if we, if I want it to hit me in the back of the head, I have to match that speed at the rate that the the curve of the Earth pulls away from it. Mm -hmm. So that's its like tangential velocity. So if you match those, it's constantly at the same distance from the Earth uh, as long as you maintain that speed, that sideways motion. So that's kind of like if if we look at Leo, Leo is a certain uh, distance away from from the Earth's surface, and I think that speed is roughly around like five miles per second, or five miles. Let me do quick math. It's like eighteen thousand miles per hour, and so if you think about it, right? If I have, uh, if the gravity changes as you go further and further away from the Earth, that means you have less free fall effect so you don't have to move sideways relative to the free fall as fast as you have to closer to the earth so as you move from leo mio and geo you don't have to move as fast so it's ideal to to be orbiting higher up so one that you don't experience as much air drag because the atmospheric density is you know differential based on gravity and also you don't have to put up, put in as much effort. Oh, that also, is interesting. Oh, yeah, that yeah, it's it's cool. It's so so crazy and it's super interesting. And and actually, I was I was thinking about that. For for geo satellites, they usually move as fast as the Earth, so they end up taking just one side 
of the Earth. So there needs to be there, there needs to be a combination between satellites to get all the planet because of course you're just like turning at the same velocity, so you end up seeing one side only, and it's super interesting that too. That's true. Um, that's geostationary. Whenever it's like, it's it's matching the Earth's rotation. So the Earth's rotation is like it's a little less than twenty four hours. It's like twenty three hours and fifty six minutes. And um, I think that location you set it in kilometers. Uh, to put it in imperial perspective, because you know uh, we hate the metric system for some reason here. Uh, that's like twenty twenty two twenty two ish thousand miles, and um, most of those are communication satellites. Actually, the first, I think, communication, and, you know, somebody in the comments can prove me wrong on this, but I think the first communication satellite was Telstar, and that was in the 60s. Uh, but that was put up about 22,000-ish miles. It's, it's decommissioned now, of course. But, but that's geostationary, and we also have geosynchronous. So instead of being just aligned with Earth's rotation, meaning that it's parked up there in the sky... Um, as you're looking at it as an observer, you're synchronizing it with the rotation. So like a two to one rotation would be it rotates two times every time the Earth rotates once. Um, and that can be three to one, four to one, et cetera. That's geosynchronous. So there's two pretty interesting ways to do geo orbits. Okay, that's really interesting. Did you did you learn about this, or uh, you just read about it, or you it was part of your training? Oh no, this isn't part of my training. It's just it. I learned about this in uh, dynamics, and then I've also just read it afterwards. But um, yeah, there's there's all classes that there's classes that are just devoted to Kepler's laws of motions, and whenever you build in. Uh, special and general relativity into things. It's pretty neat. Um, but Mio, since we're jumping around, I wanted to talk about Mio really quick. Mio contains most of the GPS satellites. So again, like it's a little higher than Leo. You think low Earth orbit, middle Earth orbit, and then geo, uh, geo, geostationary, geosynchronous. That's like the highest uh, orbits that you can have relative to the Earth's surface. Um, but yeah, you would think of it as okay, I'm further away from the Earth, I'm moving a little bit slower. So those uh, orbits have a longer duration than what you would get in LEO. Oh, one more thing. So duration, uh, just, just to get perspective, because this is always interesting. A LEO orbit, if you're orbiting around like the equator and you're going about 18,000 miles per hour tangentially, for the people that want to correct me, tangentially, I think that's about... 90 minute it's a 90 minute orbital duration so like you would see 18 different sunsets in a day yeah uh, it's it's an incredible amount of times <laughs> if you think about doing it the, the wrong going around the earth in 90 minutes it, it, it's it's just incredible i i don't know how you see looking at the sunset <laughs> for a satellite but <laughs> yes i get what you mean it's uh it's incredible yeah, that, that would be incredible. Plenty of photo opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's the that's the one. From oh, now sure. on, we go to satellites to take Instagram pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I've also I've kind of like laid a little bit of groundwork um on what I'd like to talk about next. And we talked about like gravitational uh, influence and how satellites move really fast relative to just like us standing on the earth, just hanging out, doing our thing. I'm sure you're familiar, of course, because you've dealt with the data and stuff, but like satellites have to have time corrections, right? Because their clocks are different than our clocks on earth, like my watch. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, that's. Do you remember when I was mentioning time that we were talking about mm, uh, levels data? So mm -hmm. we do have a process that makes the time, the, makes the data time bind. So this means that you decide where uh, you you say, okay, this was this exact moment. In fact, when you download data, you can easily have. Um, write in your code. I want to download the data from seven in the morning until eight in the in the in the evening, um, and that's something 
that you can do and it's it's also really it's also really good you have also for example a unit that has two different times that you have you have publishing time and sensing time so a sensing time is when you actually it's the moment you sense the, the data so you're saying okay after this um volcano that erupted at this exact time this was the data that the the satellite took and also you have publishing data so the time that you actually get the satellites and you set and you put them available to people you get the data and you put them available uh, so people that use for example human sat data they can decide whether they want publishing or um or sensing time uh, and of course you have that a bit for for everything every time you use satellite data um you also consider that there are times for example where um for example one day you have really bad atmosphere so you have a lot of clouds and you're using a sensor that doesn't uh, go over clouds and it is taking picture of the actual place so you end up not being able to utilize that data that image that you collected because it's covered in clouds and you cannot make a good enough atmospheric correction to go over the clouds um so this is what what happens but I mean, again i wouldn't be able to tell you exactly how scientists that, that there is like a really long work um around around mm -hmm. the, the adding what is the time uh, and specify which time you're using oh you know what's really cool um yeah. that's also depending upon how like what type of in, um waves you're using from your your satellite right because you said if you have clouds uh you're not you might not be able to get signal through. And that's because, I mean, if you, if you know how a microwave works, um, mm -hmm. microwaves, microwaves, right, on the EM spectrum, they interact with water. And yeah. that's how you heat your food. Uh, so that makes sense. If you're using a, a satellite that, has mic that uses microwaves, you're not going to be able to penetrate correctly through mm -hmm. any, any, sort of, uh, any sort of storm front. And... You can combat that if if this was like if you could uh, with a satellite that has longer wave radiation, so radio waves um, and that sort, and then you could get through the the clouds and and you're and you're chilling in that manner. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's it's really interesting because every sensor works really differently. Yeah. Um, what I, I I have learned in my time is like main differentiation between what is an active and what is a passive sensor. So a passive sensor when um, you actually don't have your source of light. Um, so satellites that, for example, the, the one I've used, uh, Olchi, and that you, you retrieve information about water, it's taking the light from the sun. This means it does not work, for example, when it's night, you cannot it can take information and night with a passive sensor uh, but then you have active sensors uh, where you actually produce the light uh, so based on the light um, and the distance of the light then you can take it you can go over clouds clearly because you have a light this is how we make topography maps the majority for with leader or SAR um, we get mm -hmm. to, to send the laser kind of a laser a reader throw towards towards the um the earth and then just by calculating the distance uh that the la that laser took to um you know to change its properties then you know the object is there um so this I would say that the ma two main categories of satellites passive and uh, sensors passive and active sensors oh wow well. <laughs> yes it's a, and, and as you say it really it really really depends on uh, on the sensor you're using and that's why there is so many different sensors and so many different ways to analyze um and and you also don't really get data just you know for for again another example is always the same uh but when i study particles in the water i don't i don't take data about particles in the water i take data about backscattering coefficient right so how yeah. much does the light move um and and what is the concentration in the water of that so it's also understanding how to use those data and that's why we need so much science and so much research so people actually get the data and they start using them for their own researches and try to find algorithms to then uh in, use the data in a different way and, and it's really incredible how many things you can do that makes perfect sense I like that. <laughs> To, through satellites, they managed to um, to discover the secret of the um, uh, Easter Island. 
do you know Easter Island? Uh, yeah. Easter Island is yeah the, the one of the statues and it was like the mystery that nobody knew how they moved these statues around they were too big and with satellites they were able to um, to to find out the kind of um movement of the soil so the the path that people would take so they started they created another easter island statue i don't know why it's, it's called <laughs> um, they created a moai and they wrapped it around with ropes and they started moving it and see if they could move it like that and it, that movement would create the same pattern that they saw with satellites so now we know that they actually moved the statues because they were able with with ropes to move the, the the statues all over the island and that's thanks to satellites it's crazy oh so they like they they must have like roped the top of them and like moved it like corner by corner kind of like um like edging edging it forward yes you know? they would make yeah. it properly. like they, they they define it as actual walking right so yeah. they move they move they, they pushed in a way that it would lose the balance on one side and on That's the so other cool. and then just walk uh, from the other side it's it's really interesting you can do a lot of things yeah that's really cool that's really cool yeah. i want to i want to jump back just really quick and explain the the time corrections for yeah. the the satellites because i think that's really cool and it it gives light to special and general relativity because i'm sure there's a lot of people out there that like you know, it's it's it seems like almost magical mathematics, uh, but it's extremely applicable mathematics. And satellites is a great example of that. So special relativity tells us that if something is moving relative to you or I at a faster speed, that something's internal clock should tick slower. So time will go by slower for it. Um, we know this through the the Hafel Keating experiment. It was where they had uh, jetliners that went around the world, um, and they measured the time of the clock on the plane relative to the clock that was on the ground. And they found that based on special relativity and in, in Einstein's predictions and Einstein's mathematics, that the experimental data and the mathematical data aligned perfectly within ten percent uncertainty, which is fantastic. That proves special relativity exists. And then general relativity tells us that if something is traveling relative to you or I, where the gravitational field is stronger, time will tick slower for that thing that is moving. So that's like, if we think about it in terms of satellites with respect to you and I on the surface of the earth, the satellites with respect to us are farther away from the center of the earth so it experiences less gravitational pull so their time the satellite's time ticks faster than ours does and in most cases they're moving faster than we are on the surface of the earth and that's depending of course on its uh, orbit and objective so their time ticks slower than ours now the cool thing is is when you compare these effects of general and special relativity, especially for GPS satellites in like mid-Earth orbit, the gravity actually wins. The gravitational effect um, has more has more effect on time dilation, which is super super cool. So the it's it's further away from us, of course, and its uh, its time is ticking faster. So that's how they have to correct they have to either change the way that the satellite functions or they have to change the data or interpret the data with the understanding of special and general relativity which is pretty cool wow that's that is super interesting i i didn't i didn't know that and you're i'm learning so much it's clear you're a phys you studied physics no yeah studied physics i'm not a physicist studied physics yeah. Maybe someday. <laughs> Maybe someday. No, but no. Um, <laughs> the really interesting thing is, and I, I took a blurb uh, from a study from Ohio State University um, because I wanted to put like a perspective on on the math. The middle Earth, a, a middle Earth orbit, mid Earth orbit satellite should tick faster than the um, 
identical clocks on the ground by about 38 microseconds. So that's like 38 times 10 to the negative six seconds per day. Now you think that's, you know, Sam, what the hell? Like that's, that's super small. Why do we even care? Um, <laughs> but the funny thing is, is like, it's GPS is high precision and it requires actually nanosecond accuracy. So like 38 microseconds is 38,000 nanoseconds. So if you didn't properly take this into account, the navigational fix, you know, based on the GPS constellation would be false after just only two minutes. So like the errors in global positions would continue to accumulate at a rate of about 10 kilometers each day. So it would just be like, why do we even have it up there? It's completely worthless without the correction. So that's why Einstein's special and general relativity is, is super, super important for satellites. And if you didn't have it and we didn't understand it we wouldn't be able to take the phone that we have in our pocket and go to grandma's house we'd be screwed we'd be over <laughs> yes over. Exactly. <laughs> yeah you know but, it's really interesting that you're also talking about gps because then again we go back to um gps is obviously a, a great tool and it's american um in in uh, i mean uh, the the gps um correct me if i'm wrong the gps was a mission is actually is actually american there is right. a lot of similar global positioning systems that are applied in you in europe or in in china uh so there is a lot but we always talk yeah. about yes right so we're going back to the same conversation uh, but of yeah. course who doesn't use uh, google maps so <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, the, all the apple maps people are screaming right now they're not happy yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I don't use maps. It's, I have an iPhone, but I don't use maps. It's so uncomfortable. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, I'm the same way. Anyways, so I think um, we've exhausted this segment enough. And when we come back, we're going to explain or just, you know, kind of introduce some more things about satellite data. So stick around. All right. This is the last segment. Uh, <laughs> this is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has been a, a, an interesting trip talking about a lot of really cool and applicable things. I guess in this segment, we're going to start out with some interesting applications of satellite data. So, Noemi, what do you got for me? Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting part of remote sensing because um, I have known so many people working with satellite data and they have done things completely different from what I have ever heard before. So I as I was mentioning before, um, there is there is a quite a big application from archaeologists as um, the, the, the statues of the Easter Island, but also they discovered through satellites, for example, the um, older pyramids in Egypt. I don't know if you read about that, but the, the pyramids that the classic pyramids, the European pyramids, they are not the oldest. And um, a scientist, also a woman, uh, she, she discovered the other pyramids through satellite data. Um, so this is a big, kind of a big part is also that from, from archaeology. Um, then, for example, I heard other other researchers. Um, they were studying. Um, they were trying to find out where uh, whales would uh, would um, strike. It's called strike. Uh, sorry, my Italian sometimes St strand strand. That's that's uh, that's um, stranding, right? Uh, when when a whale gets gets just left on the on the beach, that's stranding. Like oh, whale stranded. Oh, okay. <laughs> Got you. <Strand>. That, that <laughs> is the stranding and not stranding. Sorry. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, or maybe in English pronunciation, American is different. I don't know. I'm finding excuses. <laughs> <You're> good. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so they were studying how to uh, figure out where whales would have been uh, stranding. Um, and they were following the whales through satellites, through satellites data and trying to understand how to save them. So as soon as they would um, discover that a certain whale, that a, that a whale was stranding on a beach uh, by following their path that they were doing throughout the time, uh, they, they could save the whale. 
so it was a great application um they have also found many ways to you know study biodiversity for example this is one of the biggest studying biodiversity with um satellites is a, is a great way that we have uh to analyze our our planet um or they they have studied as well for example the movement of dams that was my old job actually i was um studying with sar which is another uh, the synthetic aperture radar um i was studying how dams would move i don't know if you know but dams they are not fully staying stable all the time uh, it seems crazy because it's a dam and you're like how is it not staying <laughs> stable but it does move and with uh, satellite data we can understand millimetric changes from um one spot to the other one so we would study uh dam failure with satellite data okay. um i also know that they've been you know many islands have been discovered through satellites and actually there was this satellite called landsat and landsat one was the first one and it was um the first of the series landsat and uh, it discovered a new island and this island was called Landsat Island. Um, you can you can you can Google it and find it. I mean, you know, people say that it's not really an island; it's more of a rock because it's true. It's more of a, a rock more than an actual island. Uh, but they gave it they gave it this name, and uh, <laughs> and that because it was discovered by satellites. Um, but I feel that generally speaking, satellites are used in so many different ways uh, and it's it's a great way that we have to explore better and it's actually something that we really really need from um from people using satellite is is this is using them using the data uh after we have created you know the satellites we send them into space we can make all these calculations and now we have the data what do we do with them what's the best way we have to utilize this data and i think that's the best um the best part there is so many ways and so many um different properties that you can you can use to study satellites and also like your background for example i feel that there is quite of misunderstanding of people that are able to enter this kind of business um so people are often thinking oh you need to be an aerospace engineer or uh, an engineer to to enter this um it's not really true. Uh, you can enter remote sensing and satellite data in a lot of different ways. And if you consider in my team, we have such different backgrounds. Like some of us are uh, computer engineers. Sometimes some of us are um, geologists. I am an environmental scientist, hydrologist, actually. Um, and we have cloud engineers. And it's a uh, it's a lot of work that can be done from a lot of different sites. And um, generally, again, people are like, it's, it's rocket science, you know? It's not everything is rocket science. Not everything in space in, is rocket science. Uh, you don't need to know everything to be able to uh, enter this subject. So I feel this is something really important for people to understand, to know that it doesn't matter what is your background, that if you are interested in this type of uh, business, you can certainly be able to enter it somehow. Yeah, most definitely. <clears throat> I mean, like you said, it, the applications are endless. You can go from from weather data collection. You can look at biodiversity. You can look at uh, luminosity and uh, population density. You can do so many different things. Um, yeah. You don't have to just be a data analyst. It's so funny because like when you go into higher education on most of the sciences, probably all of the sciences, I'll just say, you're going to have some form of data application, some data analytics that you'll have to do. And it just makes sense. And the, the last thing I think that I think I want to say to what you what you were talking about is that, yeah, we need I, I've probably said this so many times in, from different podcast episodes, but different backgrounds result in different solutions. And you need many different types of solutions to uh, formulate. A, a strong answer or stance Absolutely. on something. 
So, Absolutely, the perspective of of people, yeah. like the, it's uh, the diversity of the scientific community generally. I mean, in every community, um, but in the scientific community, is really important because you get different perspectives. Uh, you get different ways of seeing and looking at a problem, and different ways of solving the problem. Uh, so, if we don't have we don't have a community and we don't have collaboration then what are we doing we are just aiming to um to do nothing to discover things for ourselves but this is not the point of science um and i think that the more we grow as a society as a community and we more are like trying to learn how to be a better community together and work together that's when we um then we're doing progresses because if not it doesn't it just doesn't work uh being diverse is it's fundamental in in the community so i'm, I'm really glad that you know i i am in a really diverse team um all my backgrounds has always been in really diverse groups and and it's great because you get to learn a lot i have recently heard this um this um, recording of a podcast um and and it was uh, there was this girl she was talking about how you shouldn't never be the smartest person in the room um and that's i think that 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 is so true because nobody's ever the smartest person in the room because it really depends on on the type of people that you have everybody has a really different background has learned really different things and that's when when you can actually reach to to a common knowledge because you you get different uh ideas that are based on different knowledge if not what would be the point of being a team right oh totally yeah, yeah. and and also in terms of like coming to a conclusion um in terms of a problem set you have to think about the inclusion because if there isn't inclusivity you're going to leave out like certain groups because data you know is applicable to everybody um whether it's climate data or luminosity data or just anything like that because you know people exist everywhere in in uh different shapes and forms so they have to be represented if not they're left out and that's not progress yeah absolutely absolutely we we need that more than than anything uh and we also need to to you know put more effort for those communities that don't have the same access as as a, a more developed community but then we enter in, in more politics oh. <laughs> yeah. nope. before we get into politics um <laughs> i'm gonna ask noemi if she has anything else that she wants to say if not we're going to get out of here. Yes, I just want to say, please be uh, excited. <laughs> Do never doubt yourself if you want to study something, if you're interested in remote sensing. Uh, you can ask me or some anything you guys want. Um, and don't be scared because really there is so much to learn. There is so much to know. And people science needs you more than anything. It needs everybody. So that's my that's how I'm going to leave you. Beautiful. Noemi, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sam. It was such a nice conversation. Absolutely. All right. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. <laughs> that is all for this episode of Everything Steam. I just wanted to take a quick second and thank Noemi for taking the time to share her knowledge and expertise on satellites, data, and remote sensing. Definitely make sure that you check out her content on Instagram. You can find Noemi at nowoman.noscience. I would also love to mention my amazing team for their collective efforts to make this show happen. This podcast was edited by Ariel Piermont, marketed by Courtney Page, QC'd by Penny Pitt Erickson, and our episode art was created by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We're always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out with the fight against the algorithms. Lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and fun Steam content. Just search Everything Steam on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Reddit to join in on the fun. Once again, thank you for listening to Everything Steam. I'm your host, Sam Stanford, and as always, stay curious. <laughs>